during the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he gave many important discourses. But if I were to ask you this afternoon, which would you put down as the most important and most outstanding, which one would you say? I think most of you would say the Sermon on the Mount, wouldn't you? And yet there's another lecture which is by far uh, the most outstanding lecture of the entire ministry of Jesus Christ. And there's one easy way of just discovering this, and that's by considering the amount of time uh, given to it by the Bible writers. So if you have your Bibles there handy, just open them with me, and we'll see how much space is taken up in the Bible recording the Sermon on the Mount. So turn to Matthew chapter 5, and let's see how much space this well-known sermon occupies. Matthew chapter 5. Now you notice Jesus begins his um, lecture here in verse 1. It occupies the whole of chapter 5, so turn over to chapter 6. All chapter 6 is occupied in this well-known sermon on the mountain. And over to chapter 7 now, and you notice he concludes in verse 29. So that's three chapters of Matthew's 28 chapters recording the Sermon on the Mountainside. But did you know there's another lecture that occupies nearly a quarter of one of the Gospels? It occupies five whole chapters, a quarter of the book of John. So let's turn to this lecture you'll find it begins in John chapter 13. So open your Bibles now at John's Gospel chapter 13. This is where the lecture begins. Look at chapter 14. All of chapter 14 is occupied with the same subject. So is chapter 15. Turn on to chapter 16 of John's Gospel and on to chapter 17 and he concludes his discourse with the beginning of chapter 18. So just think of that, nearly five whole chapters recording this discourse of Jesus, nearly a quarter of John's Gospel. So quite clearly the subject of this lecture must have been the most outstanding in the ministry of Jesus. Well what was it all about? Well what I'd like to do first of all is try and describe the scene of this final lecture and then you'll get the background and setting for it. So if you'd like to come with me now on this very pleasant spring evening through the darkened streets of Jerusalem in this year 33 of our common era to what we would call today the better class residential district of the town because the houses in this particular part of Jerusalem were of the semi-detached or detached type of houses and I'd like to draw your attention on this pleasant evening to one of these homes. It's situated in this respectable and select neighborhood. It's standing alone, and it's got a nice walled garden all around it. And in this particular home, there's a special meeting going on on the third floor this night. So if you'd like to come with me into this room, we'll see what's going on. It's a room about the size of this first part of the hall here. And down the center of the room is a long table, and there's 13 couches or divans around this table. And reclining on these couches are these 13 men. And as I look down the table, I can see the remains of a meal. I can see a large platter in the center of the table, and on this platter are the remains of a lamb that's been roasted whole, and the several plates of unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And I can see several goblets of unsweetened red wine. What's been going on in this upper room on this pleasant evening of the year 33? Anyone like to tell me what's been going on there, sister? The Passover, that's right. As devout Jews, these men have been commemorating the Passover to celebrate the deliverance of their nation from slavery some 1,500 years previously. So let's move in now and begin to pick up the conversation. And as we do, something else strikes us very forcibly. These men are not local men at all. They're speaking with a, a strange accent. Of course, you recognize it now. They all come from the north. They're Galileans. They're not Judean men at all. With the exception of one. 
There's only one there who's a local man, a Judean, and he's sitting in the place of honor on the right-hand side of Jesus. And as the meal now comes to the end, Jesus turns to this man sitting, sitting in the honored place on his right, and he says to him, what you have to do, go and get it done quickly. And with that, Judas Iscariot, the odd man out, he always has been, the only Judean in the group of twelve, he leaves the party, descends the stairs, and makes his way out, and only after he's gone does Jesus then turn to the remaining eleven faithful Galileans and give them this most important lecture. But now, what was it all about? Well, he explains right at the very beginning the subject of this discourse. And if you look at John's Gospel, chapter 13, and verse 34, this is the subject of the next five chapters of John's Gospel. John 13, verse 34. Jesus says, I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this all will know that you are my disciples. Rather interestingly, if you'd like to check it sometime, you read through those five chapters and see how many times you can count that identical expression, I'm giving you a new commandment. And you'll find that same expression occurs over 30 times in those next five chapters, showing that this was the theme of his final lecture the one he gave the night before he died. And the subject of his final lecture was the new commandment. So that's what we want to talk about this afternoon. So what was this new commandment? Would you say it was the commandment that we should love our neighbor as ourselves, would you? It couldn't possibly have been that one. Why not? Because that was never part of Christ's doctrine. Surprisingly, Jesus never taught that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Does anyone know who was it who taught that doctrine? It wasn't Jesus Christ. Brother Gray. It was Moses who taught that. In fact, in the law of Moses, at Leviticus 19 and verse 18, Moses said, And you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And every one of the Hebrew prophets from Moses right down till John the Baptist taught the doctrine of neighbor love. So if Jesus had merely spoke about this subject of neighbor love in this final lecture, would it have been a new commandment? Do you think so? No. So quite clearly then this new commandment to love is something quite different, quite separate from the law of Moses that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And surprisingly, most people think that Jesus taught that doctrine, and yet he didn't. Of course, there was the occasion when the rich young Pharisee came to him and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of Moses' law? And Jesus said, Well, it's love your neighbor as yourself. That's one of the two greatest commandments. But Jesus never told it. So I thought it would be good at the beginning of our lecture this afternoon to make a contrast. Let's take that commandment of Moses to love our neighbor as ourselves. And let's see that good though it is, it's not for the Christian. Because it's totally inadequate for Christianity. So shall we do that? Well, let's take the final prophet of the Hebrews. And he was the one who explained neighbor love more than anybody else. And let's see just what was entailed in loving our neighbor as ourselves. And you'll see that while it was a good law, not good enough for us. So turn now to Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Turn now to Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. And let's read verse 10 and 11. And notice how John the Baptist explains what neighbor love is to these repentant Jews. In verse 10, it says, and the crowds would ask him, What then shall we do? In reply he would say to them, Let the man that has two undergarments share with the man that has none. 
and let him that has things to eat do the same. And John said, if you do that, you're loving your neighbor as yourself. And just think what was entailed in that. John said, if you've got two undergarments, what does it mean? It means you're in surplus. Because in those days, they weren't as hygienic as we are now, you see. You just wore it till it fell off. So, if you had two undergarments in those days, it means you had a spare one hanging up in the closet, you see. So, John said, neighbor love means taking that spare undergarment and giving it to some poor neighbor of yours who hasn't got one. And then on these cold wintry nights, when you're snug and warm in bed in your woolly undervest, that poor neighbor that you gave your spare one to, he also will be snug and warm in his woolly undervest, the one you gave him. So in that way, you'll be loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Well, there's no hardship in that, is there? You see? And he says, it's the same with food. If you've got a surplus of food, if you've got more than you can actually use, well, don't hoard it. Give the surplus away. And then when that neighbor of yours is enjoying that food you gave to him, you'll be loving him as much as you love yourself. But again, there's no hardship in that, is there? So if neighbor love were the new commandment, do you think it would make us unique and distinctive? outstanding from all other peoples? Do you think so? No, it wouldn't. Because how many people in the world that you know practice neighbor love? I'm sure a great majority of them. In fact, I've never read a better definition of neighbor love than I saw on an Oxfam leaflet about three or four Christmases ago. And on the front of this Oxfam leaflet, it said this. We know that many of you have more this Christmas time than you need. So what we're asking is that you give us your surplus so we can give it to the starving millions in Asia and Africa so that at this Christmas time they can enjoy some of the good things you are enjoying. So what was the Oxfam organization asking people to practice? Neighbor love, you see. So if Christians simply practice neighbor love, it would not be unique, it would not be outstanding, it would not be a new commandment. So then what is this new commandment that Jesus went into such great lengths to discuss that final night of his earthly life? Well, let's go back to John 13 and see if we get a clue from his opening words. Let's go back to John chapter 13. And notice how he begins in verse 34. He says there, I am giving you a new commandment. And what is it? That you love one another just as I have loved you. So there's the all important expression. We're to love, love not with neighbor love. It's not enough. We're to love with the same kind of love that Jesus Christ loved. Now what kind of a love was it that Jesus demonstrated? Was it love of neighbor or giving out of his surplus? Hardly. The quality of Jesus' love was new. It was unique. It had never been seen among mankind before. And all through his ministry, he not only discussed and spoke about this new love, but he demonstrated it. And just think what he did to demonstrate this love. Think of what he gave up to demonstrate this new quality. He left his wonderful position in the heavens with his father. He emptied himself of all that glory. And he came down here to be a man lower than the lowest angel. To suffer all that shame, that ignominy. And to die that torturous death on the stake. Now, would he have done all of that if he had simply loved his neighbor as much as he loved himself? No. So, it was a new kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. And people noticed this new kind of love. It was selfless. It was sacrificial. And it was always governed 
by the righteous principles of God's word. This was the new love that Jesus left as a new commandment upon all his followers. Let's just take some examples in the ministry of Jesus Christ to show the, the quality of this new love that he brought into the human race. Would you turn with me to Mark's Gospel now? Turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. <coughs> and I'd like to read to you from verse 32 onwards. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 32. This is how the account reads. After evening had fallen, when the sun had set, the people began bringing him all those who were ill and those demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered right at the door. So he cured many that were ill with various sicknesses, and he expelled many demons. But he would not let the demons speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. And early in the morning, while it was still dark, he rose up and went outside and left for a lonely place. And there he began praying. However, Simon and those with him hunted him down and found him, and they said, All are looking for you. Just think of the quality of this man. He works till late at night. After it had become dark, healing, feeding, serving people. And then he's up before dawn next morning, still continuing this service. And people are not afraid to hunt him out and beat us. Everybody's looking for you. Where do you think you've been? You see? And yet he was still anxious to move in and serve them. What a selfless, sacrificial quality of love that he was demonstrating. Let's take another example. Turn to Mark chapter 6. And notice how Jesus was always ready to extend himself and be totally spent in serving others. Mark chapter 6, and let's read from verse 30 to 34. Now just before we read it, let me put you in the background here. What we're going to read came at the end of an exhausting missionary tour. And the disciples of Jesus, as well as Jesus himself, were worn out, exhausted. So with that background, that, now let's read the account. Verse 30. And the apostles gathered together before Jesus and reported to him all the things they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come, you yourselves privately into a lonely place and rest up a bit. For there were many coming and going, and it was not convenient even to eat a meal. Can you see the picture? Can you see all the disciples standing round Jesus, looking worn out, hungry, and thirsty. And Jesus says, you boys look all in. And Peter says, I feel it, Lord, too. I haven't eaten for days looking after this lot. So Jesus, I'll tell you what, let's try and find a quiet little place. We'll get away from these. We'll just slip away while they're not looking. And we'll all rest up a bit and have a bite to eat. Peter says, a great idea, Lord. I know it's just the place. I know a quiet little cove about two mile row across the lake and if we just get the boat out while nobody's looking we can get over there and rest up a bit get the boat out says Jesus let's read on verse 32 so off they went in the boat for a lonely place to themselves but people saw them going and many got to know it and from all the cities they ran there together on foot and got ahead of them can you see the picture they just get out on the boat, rowing quietly across to this lake, and suddenly these crowds of people who they've been serving and feeding and healing and teaching for days, they suddenly realize their meal ticket's gone. And one of them gets a line on the boat. He says, I know where they're going. They're going to that quiet little cove, the other side of the headland. Let's all run round and make a welcoming committee. You see, so these people tear off around the lake, and as they run through villages, they get everybody out. Come with us, you'll get a free meal. So they all tear off around the lake, you see. And when Peter rows the boat ashore, it's not a quiet little cove anymore. There's these thousands of hungry, eager people. Now, how would you feel? You haven't eaten for days, you're worn out, you've been serving these people. 
how would you feel when you just row in the boat ashore and here they are all waiting for you? Wouldn't you feel like saying, now look, friends, the shot's shot. Wouldn't you feel like saying that? You see? But did Jesus say that? No, he didn't. Let's see what happened, verse 34. It says, well, on getting out, he saw a great crowd, but he was moved with pity for them, because they were a sheep without a shepherd, and he starts to teach them many things. He even feeds them, heals them. What kind of love do you think that was? Wasn't this this new quality that Jesus was showing? Sacrificial, selfless, a love governed by it righteous principles it certainly was and not only that but people noticed that this new quality of love was, that Jesus showed was vastly superior to any neighbor love they'd learned before just to illustrate that turn with me to Matthew chapter 19 I was wondering whether you ever noticed this when you read this very well known account You'll know the account very well, but let's examine it perhaps a little more closely than we've done previously. Matthew chapter 19, and we start at verse 16 onwards. It says, Now look, a certain one came up to him and said, Teacher, what good must I do in order to get everlasting life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? One there is that is good. If though you want to enter into life, observe the commandments continually. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, Why? You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. Do you notice that? That last command there. What was Jesus lumping neighbor love in with? The rest of the law. But notice how this young man answers. The young man said to him, I have kept all of these. What yet am I lacking? Wasn't that a shrewd observation? This young man said, I've always loved my neighbor as myself. I've always done what Moses told us to do, to give out of our surplus to those in want. But what yet am I lacking? He realized that neighbor love was lacking in the quality that he'd seen manifest in the ministry of Jesus Christ. What yet am I lacking? See how Jesus answers in the next verse. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and be my follower. When the young man heard this saying, he went away grieved, for he was holding many possessions. You notice that point? He was prepared to love his neighbor, but what was he not prepared to do? He wasn't prepared to observe the new commandment to copy and imitate the love of Jesus because it meant sacrifice it meant giving up something and neighbor love never demands that so this is the new quality of love and friends did you know that this quality was so new in the first century that they hadn't got a word to describe it and as you also know that the common language in the first century was Greek and there wasn't a word in the Greek language to describe this new quality of love so does anybody know what the Christians did? they invented a new word the Christians invented this word and they invented the word to describe this new quality that Jesus Christ brought into the world of mankind. So what was the word that the Christians invented in the first century? You won't find it in any other writings of that period outside the writings of the Bible. The Christian writings. It was agape. Did you know the Christians invented the word? Well, they did. 
They invented it to describe this new quality that Jesus Christ brought into the world. So let's put that on the board. So there's the word that the Christians invented to explain this new quality that Jesus brought into the world. So we put that on the board there. And this is the kind of love it is. It's a selfless, principled concern for other people. So don't put that up there as well. So that's the kind of love that Jesus left as a new commandment. Well, is it easy to practice this kind of love? No, it isn't. And that's why if you look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul said this about this new quality of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1. He says there that we must what? Pursue love. Pursue agape is what he said. Now why must we pursue it? When you're pursuing something, what do you do? What does the word pursue suggest to you? Anyone in the audience? Brother. To chase after something, so it's not easy. What else does the word pursue suggest? Brother. Good, yes, and Brother Gray? Rather elusive. That's right, it's just kind of out of your grasp. So something you've got to be reaching for all the time. And that's true, it is. And the reason why this quality is so elusive is because it runs contrary to our nature. It's the very opposite of what we naturally are. Because this love is selfless. It's sacrificial. And naturally, as humans, we're always interested in self, aren't we? Not that there's anything wrong in that. But this love goes contrary to our nature. And that's why the scriptures show that it's only the Christians who can display this love. Nobody outside the Christian congregation even knows about this love. Less is able to express it. Because as John says in 1 John 4, 9, unless you come to know God through Jesus Christ, you cannot know love, agape. Because God is love, agape. This new quality that Jesus Christ revealed. And the reason why nobody outside the Christian congregation can express this quality is because as Paul says in Galatians 5, it's a product of the Holy Spirit. And unless one has God's Holy Spirit, they're not able to show it, they're not able to even understand it. Because unlike the other qualities of love, this is the very opposite of them. You see, in the first century, there were three Greek words for love. I'll put them on the board and see if you can identify them. There was one Greek word that was in common use in the first century, philia. But that didn't express this quality. So we put that on the board. Now does anyone know what kind of love that is? Sister? Yes, love for friends. You see, love that you naturally have for your friends. So let's put that up there. So that's love of friends. Now does that love need to be pursued? You have to work on that kind of love. Do you, brother? No, it comes naturally. You love your friends. It's the most natural thing in the world, isn't it? So certainly Jesus wouldn't give you a need to give you a commandment to love your friends. Because it comes naturally, spontaneously. There's another word that was in use in the first century to describe another quality of love. Does anyone know what kind of love that is, Brother Gray? Love for your family. Love for your family like the love between parents and children and children for their parents. Let's put that on the board. So that's love for the family. Now, do you need to pursue storgy love? Do you? Would you have to have a new commandment to love your family, your children, your parents, sister? No. So you see, that wasn't the kind of love that the Bible speaks of either. There's still a third kind of love. What kind of love there? That's what the world is always singing about, isn't it, Brother Gray? 
Yes, love between the sexes. Now, there's nothing wrong in that. You see, Jehovah put that kind of love in mankind. But you have to pursue that kind of love. Would you need a new commandment for that sort of love? Well, hardly. In fact, the difficulty is to stop yourself. Isn't there? You don't have to pursue it. It's a case of restraining yourself. So let's put that one to me. That's the love for the opposite sex. So now, do you get the point? These three kinds of love are all natural. They're things we do by nature. But this one is contrary to nature. Because this one is sacrificial and selfless. Whereas all of these three here have some sort of self-interest in them. We're not saying selfish. Your family members, why? Because again of the flow back into your own life. It's true, isn't it? There's a feedback there, you see. And you certainly love your wife or your fiancé. Why? Because of the pleasure and satisfaction it brings. The Bible speaks of the love of Christ. It hasn't these three kinds of love in mind at all. And when the Bible speaks of God being the God of love, it's not referring to this kind at all. But when the Bible in the Christian scriptures speaks of love, it's talking about this new quality that Jesus Christ brought into the world of mankind. And that's it, the agape principle. And we should always think of it as totally and completely separate from these other three. Not four kinds of love, no. There are these three natural kinds of love, which everybody has. And there's this agape kind of love which we must pursue, we must cultivate, we must obey as a commandment, because it's so different, so unique to mankind. Now, if you turn with me to 2 Peter 1 and verse 7, let's see what Peter had to say about this quality of love. 2 Peter 1 and verse 7. Well, I think we'll read the whole of this section because you get the feel of it then. 2 Peter 1 verses 5 through to 7. Yes, for this very reason, by your contributing in response all earnest effort, supply to your faith virtue, to your virtue, knowledge, to your knowledge, self-control, to your self-control, endurance, to your endurance, godly devotion, to your godly devotion, brotherly affection, that's philia, to your brotherly affection, philia, supply agape. Now all the way through the Christian Greek scriptures were given this advice that we must supply agape to these three other kinds of love in order to keep these kinds of love in check and in their right position. And you can see why. Say, for example, you as a Christian ignore the agape principle. What might you start showing to your friends? Well, surely favoritism. You might start covering up their wrongdoings because he's a friend of yours and you want to retain his friendship. That's why Peter says you must apply agape to your filia. So that if your brother in the Christian congregation does something, you will see that he is reproved, disciplined. Why? Because even though you may lose his personal friendship, you're concerned with his eternal interests. And you'll always do what is right, according to right principle, as Jesus did. So that's the agape principle that we must always add to our filial affection. But the scriptures show that we must also add agape to our stodgy affection. Why are there so many delinquents today and unruly children? Isn't it because parents only express that quality, stodgy love? They give their little infants everything they want. Why? Because they're afraid of losing the affection of their little kiddies, aren't they? You see? But now a Christian parent will never do that. 
A Christian parent will always make sure that the affection they have for their children is governed by the agape principle. So when the little boy does something and needs discipline, then he'll be taken out in the woodshed and duly thrashed. You see? And what was it which will make the parent give that necessary thrashing? Agape love. Even though temporarily the parent may lose the child's affection because the parent knows that in the long run it's right that the child should be disciplined by the godly, righteous principles of God's word. So you see how we must always add this to the Storgy. And what about Eros? Well, what's the cause of most of the delinquency in the world today? Because people are allowing this sort of love to run riot. Is that true? Well, you can see that in any Sunday newspaper. But you see, the Christian, he will always add a agape to any erotic feelings he may have. And that will always control his feelings and never allow his feelings to go contrary to the righteous principles of God's word. Now you can see why Jesus said it was a new commandment, can't you? Can you see now why the apostles said we must pursue it? Why must we pursue this agape principle? Why do you think? In view of what we've said so far in our discussion, brother at the back. That's right, it's contrary to nature. And Sister Gray, yes, it goes contrary to our selfish, fallen nature. So that's why we must pursue it as a new commandment. Now, with that understanding of this new commandment that Jesus brought into the world, into the Christian faith, let's turn to that very well-known description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm sure now we'll understand it just that little bit more clearly now that we understand exactly what word Paul is using. So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll start at verse 4. He says, love, agape, is long-suffering and kind. Now why? Because it's selfless, you see? And if you're totally selfless, never thinking of self, would you ever become short-tempered and unkind? No. But because you're always putting your own interests at the back and the concern of others at the front, that's what a agape makes you do, put self in the background. That's why love, agape, is long-suffering and kind. He says love is not jealous. That's agape. But are these kinds of love jealous? They're full of jealousy. Is a man jealous over his wife? Of course he is, and rightly so. Jehovah was jealous over Israel. So you see, erotic love isn't the love he's talking about here. Is a man jealous over his family? Of course he is. It's my boy Johnny, you see. And every mother's got their perfect child, hasn't she? You see. So of course Storgy is full of jealousy. And even with filial love, a man is jealous for his friends. But the agape love is not jealous. Why not? Because it's totally selfless. It has no self-interest. It's sacrificial. It says, love does not brag, does not get puffed up. Why not? Because it puts itself out of sight. But these love have all some sort of self-interest in them. Not that that's wrong, but the whole self-oriented. We'll move on. He says, agape does not behave indecently. Why not? Because it's based on the righteous principles of God's law. Whereas these love in themselves, you could be quite indecent in the practice of them. But agape is never indecent, because it always keeps those high principles of the scriptures in mind. It says it does not look for its own interests, does not become provoked. Why not? Because it keeps self out of sight. It's this sort of love that can keep you cool under provocation. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses in their ministry, 
walk up a pathway of a man who the last time they knocked on his door threw them out. Now what propels them up that pathway? Is it any filial affection for the man who lives in that house? Hardly. Is it any stodgy love for him? They don't know him. Do they feel all erotic towards him? What is it that propels them up that path to give this man the word of life? It's a garfe. This selfless principal concern for this man because we know that his life, his eternal life, depends on accepting the good news. And we're prepared to send another hail of abuse. Why? Because we love him. Not with any natural kind of love, but we love him with this new quality of love that's a product of God's spirit, agape. That's why during World War II it was said of Jehovah's Witnesses in those Nazi concentration camps that they loved agape, their brutal guards. Do you feel they felt friendly towards them? Or stodgy towards them? Or erotic towards them? No, it was agape because they were hoping that these brutal men might see the truth and turn to a knowledge of Jehovah God and Jesus Christ. So no wonder, he says, that love does not become provoked. It does not keep account of the injury. It does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things. Yes, it does. It always believes the best in people. It never assumes wrongdoing. It believes and hopes for the best in everybody. It says it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And it's this kind of love that never fails. So can you see this new commandment? It's difficult, isn't it? That's why Jesus says we must strive after it. And Paul said we must pursue it. It was the mark of the first century Christians, and it should be the mark of Christians today. Let's see how Paul explained that in uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 15. This shows the extent of this new commandment. 2 Corinthians 12 and it's verse 15. Paul says, For my part, I will most gladly spend and be completely spent for your souls. If I love agape you the more abundantly, am I to be loved the less? He says this agape will cause an elder not just to spend himself on behalf of his brothers, but be completely spent. What's the difference between spending and being spent? Have you ever been into town spending and you come back spent? <laughs> well, what condition are you in when you come back spent? Sister Gray? Nothing left. That's right, your pockets are empty because you've given all. Well, that's what a Garfield will do. That's what we'll make an elder do on behalf of his brother. Not just give when he's got the time. That's neighbor love. Millions of people are doing that. No. So, it will cause an elder like Paul here to be totally spent till he's nothing left. He's given all in behalf of his brother. That's the extent of this quality of love. Can you see now why Jesus said that if you practice this love, it's going to make you unique, distinctive, outstanding from anybody else. And isn't that true? How many people in the world of mankind are showing a sacrificial, selfless, principled concern for others? Nobody for the dedicated, baptized Christian witnesses of Jehovah. And by their public ministry around the world, they're proving themselves to be the true disciples of Jesus Christ because they are displaying this unique and this wonderful quality that Jesus displayed. But maybe you're thinking, I'm feeling a little despondent now. You're thinking, well, 
I can see we must obey this new commandment if we're to be the Christ's disciples. But it seems just beyond our reach. Well, it will be, but we must strive after it. And that's why Paul gave some very fine counsel to Christians who are having difficulty in observing this new commandment. I'd like you to consider his words in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, and it's verse 14. This is a wonderful text and some very practical and sound advice here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. He says, But besides all these things, clothe yourselves with love, agape, for it is a perfect bond of union. He says, clothe yourself with it. Why have you all got clothes on this afternoon? Why aren't you all sitting here naked? There must be some reason why you've gone to all that trouble of spending all that money on clothes. Why are you all clothed this afternoon? Why have you got clothes on, Brother Gray? <laughs> Brother Ross, why have you got clothes on this afternoon? It's pretty warm in here, though, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree it's what Brother Gray said? It's to cover up all the unseemliness underneath. Now, if you don't believe that, you go down to the beach at Brighton on a bank holiday and see some of these sights in the costumes and briefs. They're anything but pleasant to look at, aren't they? I mean, some are all right. But... <laughs> A majority of them, you know, there's all hair and bulging flesh and not very nice, is it? You see? But those same people come off the beach and they put a nice suit on or a dress or a costume. And what does it do? It hides up all those blemishes, doesn't it? It covers up all those unseemly parts and the ugliness underneath. It's true, isn't it? That's why you've got clothes on this afternoon, isn't it? Because it improves your appearance. It makes you look better to other people. Well, Paul said that's what you've got to do with agape. He says, I know you can't make it part of your nature because it's contrary to the nature. Because by nature we're selfish. By nature we think of self. So he says, I know you can't make it part of your nature. But why don't you do the next best thing? Why don't you wear it as a coat? That's very good advice, isn't it? Because even though you feel selfish underneath, wear that agape coat whenever you're, well, all the time, you see. And then you'll hide up all the ugliness. And then when that old brother gets you in the corner and starts needling you, you ever had that an old brother get you in the corner and needle? How did you have that, Brother Gray? Yes, young ones too, I see. But when that old brother or sister starts needling you, and you feel like just saying something, well, button your coat up with a garfi and just let him see that long-suffering, kindness, goodness, all those other qualities which are the selfless, sacrificial, principal kind of love. And the old fellow goes away saying, he's a, such a lovely brother, doesn't realize what you're really thinking inside. But the thing is, you never let it show, you see. All he saw was that wonderful garment of a Garfi love, the identifying mark of a Christian. And similarly, in your place of work, or your neighbors knowing you to be a dedicated, baptized witness of Jehovah, try to put pressure on you or abuse you. And naturally, you'd hit back. But what prevents you from hitting back? Your agape coat, you see. You wear your agape coat. And even though four years ago you'd have lashed out at him, no. You wear this coat, and all he can see is that Christ-like quality of love. In fact, so important is it to learn to wear this Christ-like quality, this new commandment, that that's the mark of survival. And the Bible shows that only those who are working, wearing this Christ-like garment of survival, uh, of, of, of qualities, are going to survive into the new system. And that's why Paul, in Romans 13, if you'll turn back to that now, in Romans chapter 13, he says, this is what we've got to do 
if we want to survive the end of this wicked, selfish, self-centered world into that righteous new world for which we've prayed. In Romans 13 and verse 14, he says, Romans 13 and verse 14, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not be planning ahead for the desires of the flesh. But what is it that we put on when we put on the Lord Jesus Christ? We put on the quality that he demonstrated, and the quality that he demonstrated through his three and a half years ministry was this new quality, and this agape principle of selfless, sacrificial love. And he says, if we're doing that, we won't be planning ahead for the desires of the flesh. Can you imagine a new order in which every single person everywhere is obeying the new commandment to love as Christ did? Where every single person in the universe is prepared to sacrifice himself and be completely spent in the service of others? If we had a universe like that, would you require any other laws? You wouldn't. And that's why the Bible says that in the coming new system, there'll only be one main law, and in many applications of it, there'll only one main law, and that's what Paul calls the law of the Christ. Now what is the law of the Christ? It's to love as Christ loved, with the agape principle. So if we want to be among those survivors into that righteous new system, then we must learn now to cultivate this new commandment. We must learn now to put on Jesus Christ, because only by putting on Jesus Christ now, by obeying the new commandment, will we survive to see that cleanser in which this agape principle is the dominating one.